I'm not going to read you a poem, but I'm going to let you listen to a song. I, I just got back from a cruise in, 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 out of Miami, and on the boat were some weird singers. I don't know if you know any of these people, but John Prine and Lou Harris, um, and a guy called Loudon Wainwright was on the, on the boat. And Loudon Wainwright III wrote a song that was a big hit back in the 1960s, or I guess in the early, in the early 70s, called Dead Skunk in the Middle of the Road, which you may have heard of. Crossing the highway late last night, he didn't see the car coming and it squashed him. And so I, I heard this song and I thought it contained so much economics. It was a good opener for a little discussion of what's going on in the housing market because it's so hard to understand. So I, I'm going to try and see if this works. Let's just try it. It's, it's a great song. We buy the morning paper. We read the sports and arts We avoid the front page And the business section breaks our hearts Read the New York Times The obits are of interest Since soon we'll have to go But what's unreal is the real estate It's a horror show there's no way we could sell our house now So we'll have to stay And you can't up and walk out on me And I can't run away We vowed in sickness and in health That means good times and bad Let's hold on to each other Happiness we have I bet should be a lifeboat now Not a battlefield Let's not give up Let's just give in Let's not stop Let's just yield Forgive me dear for saying so Please don't think I'm a louse But maybe it's a good thing We can't sell our house You get the point. It's got endogenous household formation. It's got what happens when the market tanks, which is somebody blows a whistle but only dogs and fires here. And the, Demand drops to zero, and signs go up, and prices stick. You say there's sticky prices in the housing market, but you know there are. People still sticking on prices they knew months ago. I got a phone call a few years back from a, from a well known economist who called me up and she said, I can't sell my house. I said, For Christ's sake, you're an economist. Think about it. You can sell your house, I'll buy it at the right price. So it's a tricky market. What I'm going to do today is just talk about where we are um, and, and, and do it in a kind of a specific way. I'm talking about a number of topics. Um, but uh, by and large, I'm just going to walk you through um, why it was important. First, I'm going to talk about why, why how the that this sector that accounted for about 6% of GDP sink the whole economy, and it did. There's no question. In fact, you can go back and look over the data. The, the, the real financial crisis occurred because of the behavior of the housing market and the behavior of people participating in the housing market at all levels. And so I want to make that case and talk about some of the macro results. By the way, macro and micro are very misunderstood terms. I produce indexes. Bob and Bob Schiller and I produce these indexes that people look at. And they say, they say they're terribly biased. I said, why are they biased? She says, they include these auction sales. And I said, yeah, they're sales. They're people are expressing themselves by buying property. And if we take care that these are representative, that they, they, they are virtually the same house, we get rid of ones that have changed hands. And we get rid of observations that are, when I said changed hands, if they're a different unit, we get rid of them. In any event, we, we build, you build indexes, macro indexes, on the basis of micro data. If the stock market, if the Dow Jones goes up, you don't think that every stock is going to go up. It, it has gone up. You think it's, it's an average, it's 
it's a, it's a conglomeration of a bunch of transactions, all of which are different. And when they tend to move together, the index tends to go up or down. So it's, it's stuff that has to be interpreted with caution. And in, if you want to look at zip code level data, you look at zip code level data. We make that available, we do it at a price. We give it away to Standard Poor's. Standard Poor's uses it to, to, to give you an idea of what's going on in the metropolitan areas. But uh, I'm going to talk about the macro level in, in some cases. I'll talk some about the micro level. But it, it's, it's somehow people think when you talk about the, the micro level, well, an event happened or didn't happen. It's a one or a zero. But in fact, these events occur with probabilities, uncertainty. And uncertainty is certainly present in the real estate markets. And it has to be, you have to think of everything I say today in terms of likelihood and probability, knowing full well that, you know, when you, you finally say, I think things are going to get better, I may be saying, I think it's 5149 that things are going to get better. In any event, let me, uh, let me uh, find my little slide thing here. I've got a few slides I want to show you. And we'll start with this. Uh, this is true. Um, this is the, uh, <laughs> the, the one true forecast that you know, down at the bottom says, if I pop, you're screwed. And that was absolutely correct. Um, I got this in about 19, in about 20, 20, 2002. Was sent to me as a T-shirt. I took, but I created this out of it. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, the uh, the Economist got it right in 2005. This was published in 2005. House prices didn't really start falling until September of 2005, when Boston turned down as the first among the cities that we saw actual negative change. It's it's hard to turn these things around because they're repeat sales indexes. So when they turn. It's a pretty good sign there's a turn. When they turn up, it'll be a pretty good sign that they're actually going up. So um, they picked it up in this. They, this was the cover of the of the uh, the cover of the Economist in, in, in summer of, of of 2005. This is this gives you a snapshot. I, I put this together because I, I was real curious about it. This comes from the flow of funds data. It's a table that I love to look at. I, in fact, I have a copy next to my toilet. It's, it's, a, uh, it's table B100 from the flow of funds. I mentioned that last night and never thought I was a total nerd. But it's, it's table B100, and on one page you get the snapshot of the households in the United States in a macro sense. Total assets, total liabilities, and net worth every year for 10 years on each page. So you can look back. 10 years, I looked at 2006 to 2008. If you go across the top row of numbers over here, assets, $78.6 trillion, this is in trillions of dollars. Household assets were 78 trillion, liabilities 13.4, net worth 65.2, and home equity was 12.9 of that. So in aggregate, most of net worth was still by and large in 2006, even after, that's after the run-up. But the household, the household household balance sheet on the asset side, um, 76, 78.6 total of which uh, home equity made up 12.9 of net worth. Now you follow those assets across, 76 went down to 66.6 in two years. That was a combination of the stock market decline in 2008 and the house price decline that took place in 2006. So if you wipe out housing assets and you wipe out stock market assets, we lost $12 trillion off the household balance sheet. This is not, just, this is not the whole economy. It doesn't have corporate assets and so forth, but this is financial and, and uh, real assets held by the household sector. Went down $12 trillion in a period of two years. Uh, liabilities didn't change much. If you look at 13.4, went up actually in those two years. Uh, to by about 800 billion, and then net worth went down by 12.8 billion, trillion, 12.8 trillion. These are all in trillions. I said billions because it was 0.8. Now you come over to 2011, and it, it comes back. This is as of third quarter of 2011. Uh, household assets went from 76 down to 66, back to 71, and so on balance from 2006 to the end, it's only down 7.5 trillion, that's still a lot. 
Liabilities didn't change much, 13.4 went to 13.8. Net worth went from 65 down to 57. It had been down 12, it's down now. But at the bottom, look at the bottom line. Home equity, 12.9, um, went down to 7.4. Uh, we lost 5.5 trillion in home equity, and, uh, and it's still down 6.2 trillion from where it was. That's a big impact. If you look at the spending effects of it, there's a lot of evidence that people spend when house prices go up, and they spend less when house prices go down. Uh, John Quigley and, and, and uh, Bob Schiller and I did a paper on the on the wealth effect. That is, how much did they spend and not spend? When we first ran that paper. We didn't have enough down periods to, to really catch what the effect was. Um, and, and you get, in the data, you get experiences like they had in California. In California, there was every reason to predict a decline in the housing market and housing prices in 81, 82. We, we had Volcker in the, in, in the Fed stamping both feet on the brakes, constraining monetary growth. We elected Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan put two feet on the accelerator, and when you drive your car down the street with one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator, it's not good for it. We had a 22.9% Fed funds rate in July of 1981. 22.9%. The Fed funds rate is now zero. Zero to 25 basis points. It was 22.9 in the summer of 81. That, everybody predicted, that the economy was just going to crash and burn. It did. It didn't do it enough. It came back. Volcker stamped harder on the brakes. We had a double dip. Housing starts went from two and a half million down to below a million, came back to 1.5, and then went down below one million again. Um, it, was, it was just terrible times. And it was... Um, um, I just had a senior moment. You don't have any, you don't have those around here, do you? <laughs> anyway, so um, let me look at, uh, let me just show you that period because it's an, another indication of why the housing market is important to GDP. One is the spending effect, right? Housing, uh, I, was, I was telling you about the, the, the paper I did with Schiller and, uh, and Quigley. In that first paper we did, we found that when house prices went up, people spent more, but we couldn't find it on the downside. And the reason, one of the reasons we couldn't was in, in that bad recession that I was talking about in 81, California never had house prices go down. They went flat, despite the fact interest rates, everything you could do to the housing market happened to it. And California had this huge run up. It was the first of the big booms. In, in, in the U.S. was the California boom in the late 70s. That encountered this horrible environment, the recession of 81, 82, double dip, high interest rates. Housing prices never fell. One of the reasons housing prices never fell was we had such high interest rates. And if you had to buy a new home, you had to sell the old one and trade in your 6.7% loan on your fixed rate self-amortizing 30-year mortgage, mortgage, which we used to like before we went to variable everything and option everything. Um, with the fixed rate mortgage, people wouldn't sell their houses. That just backed up the traditional downward stickiness. Nobody sold, volumes went to zero, and house prices never fell. If you have that kind of environment, it doesn't show up if you're trying to model the effect of house prices on spending, because house prices don't go down. I mean, we, we looked at the impact of a decline in the housing market in volumes, people wouldn't sell. That's traditionally the way these markets adjust. People delude themselves into thinking the value is what it was. And they won't sell below that. They have, they have minimum prices that they'll take. And for a while, every single boom, every single bust that occurs after a boom, starts out with this downwardly sticky phase where you, 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 people believe that house prices are not going to go down. They, they know their house is worth what they saw one down the street sell for. So this, this, ha this chart has a number of good things about it to, to, to illustrate. One is the severity of where we are now. Uh, the other is what I just think I talked about, was the, 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 the fact that in the data, 
there aren't good examples of periods of downturn that occur leading to spending downturns. Well, we got one starting in 2006, right? In 2006, the housing market went down 25% nationally, and we could pick up real directly from that experience how much we lost in aggregate demand as a result of that. That's a lot. It was a big impact, and it came out in the day that we republished the paper, and it now works up and down. This is, is to illustrate just how catastrophic the decline is. I, I, I know that we talked about replacement um, in the, with, the, with the, the guy who's just up. He talked about the replacement demand uh, pushing on the construction sector. Well, the construction, cons, construction sector is back, but it's not anywhere near what it was before. If you look at this diagram, the, the yellow lines are recessions. Every negative growth quarter is a yellow vertical line. So the one on the far left is 1975, is 1975, the first one. The second one is the 81-82 double dip. The third is the 90-91 minimal one except for New England and New York, which got hit pretty hard. The, uh, the, the two, two from the right, the, one, the second one from the right, is the 2001-2002 bursting of the dot-com dot bubble and 9-11 combined. That turned out not to be a big recession. It only lasted two quarters, and they were separated by a month of growth. And then the big one is what Loudon Rainwright's album is called, The Great Recession, that began in 2008, the, fall of the, the fourth quarter of 2007. But the, the red line, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the blue line that squiggles around is housing starts. Housing has been, over the last 40 years, the major instrument for monetary policy to affect the economy. If the Fed saw inflation coming, it wants to take demand down. And the way you take demand down is you raise interest rates. You drive credit out. You take credit out of the system. And when interest rates went up, housing starts were the, was the first sector to respond in every single cycle until now. So, and if, if, if the Fed wanted to speed things up at the end of recessions, it would kick the housing market, and it would do it by dropping rates. It would drop rates, and every single one, you look at every one of those recessions, at the beginning, housing starts go down. That pulls the economy into recession. When, they're had enough, when they've had enough recession, they drop rates, they pump money into the system, people start buying stuff, and for four, five, six cycles in a row, it worked perfectly. Now, where did it run out of gas? It ran out of gas in, as, as, as a monetary tool in, in the year 2000. They came into the year 2000 thinking they could use it to keep us from having a recession. Why did they think that? Well, if you're a Fed person, you talk to these guys, they think a lot about inflation as the cost. You know, if, if, if you go too fast, you're gonna have inflation, and inflation is what we have to avoid. So anytime we get inflation, they step on the brakes. That's what they did in all these cycles when things went down. Now, they didn't have to step on the, they didn't, they didn't have to worry about inflation in 2000. One of the main reasons was Y2K. We talked about that a little earlier, Y2K. Y2K was a massive amount of investment spending pulled forward into 1999. It pulled forward into 1999 because every firm in the, in, in the world threw away their computer systems and bought a new one because they thought they were going to have to, they, they were going to blow up when the date changed. I remember wa sitting watching the ball drop on, on uh, Times Square thinking the world was going to end. It didn't and they, we got over it, but it took a lot of demand out of the year 2000, 2001. So that meant we didn't have price pressure and then along came 9-11, we had the elements of recession. The Fed just opened up the floodgates and we opened up the floodgates taking the Fed funds rate from six and a half down to one. Let me show you that real quick. Yeah, let me, let me look at that one. This is another great table. I know you can't read it, but I'll tell you the essence of it. The left line there is the year 2000. The left-hand edge is the year 2000, and it takes it up to about 2008 or 9. Uh, the yellow line, if you can see it, which you probably can't, but the yellow line goes here. That's the Fed funds rate. 
And it comes up and it goes over, oh, up there it goes, over there. But in 2000, they took the Fed funds rate down 11 times. And they took it from six and a half down to one and three quarters, eventually down to one, and they held it there. That was a flood of credit, a massive amount of credit that came into the system. Took, took interest rates down to one sixth of what they were before. That credit led to a refi boom in the housing market. Everybody who was sitting on six and a half, seven percent mortgages, eight percent mortgages, refinanced them. And the industry geared up for it, and they were safe because they had equity. And house prices were rising. If you, if you own a house, or you have credit on a house, the equity portion grows exponentially when the house price goes up, because the mortgage stays the same, and as a percentage of the equity that's there, it, it's an increasing percentage. So you had all the things that happened. You had increasing foreign demand. You had 20 years of prosperity. From the day the recession in 81, 82 ended, you had unbelievable economic growth, 3% per year. The unemployment rate coming into this decade was four. It was actually below four. Most economists didn't think it could go that low. And, and, and Alan Greenspan gave a talk saying, we don't have enough debt. Do you remember that? He said, we don't have enough debt. Why? Because you can't anchor the yield curve. People can get in and buy and sell and it moves the rate. We need more debt. But if you look at the position, I remember Janet Yellen coming up and giving a talk at the Boston Fed about what are we going to do now? We haven't had a recession. It was the longest expansion in American history from the, two, from the, uh, from the 19, uh, 1990, 1990 recession, 1991 recession, to the 2001 recession. That was a 10-year period of continuous expansion. In fact, if you go back 20 years to the end of the 81 recession, it was 20 years with only two quarters of contraction. That's an unbelievable performance. Lester Thoreau, you heard of him? He used to write books every three years. And he, uh, he wrote one that said in 1982, or I guess it was 83, that the American economy was finished we would never have another year of, of good economic growth. The engine wasn't strong enough to pull us out of that severe recession. And he, he convinced everybody. I felt worse in 81, 82 than I did in the last couple of years, except for February, except for, for November of 08, when I felt really bad and had economic nightmares. You have an economic nightmare, it's horrible. The trucks stop rolling, the, the gasoline doesn't come in. And that could happen if the system broke down, but we'll put that on the other burner. Um, so, back to this story. I, I ramble. So, I don't want to go too far past it. I want to go to it. We had a refi boom. The refi boom oiled the wheels of, the, of what was happening because we had a $10 trillion portfolio of mortgages, most of it written at ridiculous rates, given where they were today. So they started refinancing. Um, if you sit down with a pencil and paper, take two and a half percent or two percent, which is about the fees that the mortgage industry gets on, a, on rolling a, a, a refinance, maybe one, two percent. Just think about the fees on ten trillion dollars of rollover. The, the, I shouldn't say this, but I will. There were five guys at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston who used to meet once every three months, and they would. Every three or four months, they'd roll their mortgages. They took a one-year teaser at 1%, and they rolled their mortgages over for 10 years, and they never paid more than 1%. And every time that was refinanced, it was more income. Although they were doing no points, no closing, the income came out of Freddie and Franny's pockets to the guys who were doing the refinance originations with no points and no closing. It was a giant game, and it was just pouring money into an industry that didn't need encouragement. I mean, the, the, the guys who ran Freddie and Fannie were pretty strong-minded to begin with, and then they had this deck, this five, five years of unbelievable profitability and growth, and then something happened. The long rates started to grow up, move up to reflect the risk. The, the answer to the risk question was always, yeah, we know this stuff is risky. We know this stuff is risky, but in fact, it's, it's not catastrophic because the collateral is there. House prices have not fallen in the United States as a whole, ever. You take the Case-Shiller Index, you take the FAO Index, you line it up from 1975 to 2005, they never go down. And guys would look at that and they'd run their models, and if you don't have a period where house prices go down, 
You don't get the effect of what happens when prices go down. But they did. They went down 26% on average in the United States. You take 26% of the value of the stock, that's a big impact on the economy. So anyway, housing's important. Let me talk about what, I, what you really want me to talk about, which where we are today, right? I mean, th th this, you can see, I'll just finish this table and then, then move on to what we're, the, 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 the critical date in all of this is right here, 2003. Because in 2003, the number of refis drops from $1 trillion. By the way, those are quarterly rates. That's not annualized. That big blue bar in the middle is the, the, the volume of mortgage originations in total in the third quarter of 2003, and it was $1 trillion in one quarter. And then it got cut in half because the long rate went up and because people were already done refinancing, the refinances went away. You take 50% out of the business, the other, the other sector in the, in the business is supposed to pick it up. And the other sector was purchase money. They, wanted to, they had to loan people who were gonna buy houses. And there weren't many qualified people. If you, if you use this qualified, what would have qualified you earlier? It wasn't, wasn't that the subprime was new. I did a paper in 1989, which calculated the, no, I'm sorry, 1999, 99, that calculated the total volume of subprime credit in the system. It was about $500 billion. There was a lot of it out there. It wasn't 10 trillion. It wasn't 40% of 10 trillion as it got close to. But it was, uh, it was, uh, it was 500 billion. And you could look at the performance of that paper and it was disturbing, but it wasn't catastrophic. Uh, but it got catastrophic when prices fell, the collateral went away and you had a new regime and you didn't have any any observations to model it with. You didn't have any paper that had ever been through anything like that. So this became a new regime. Um, let me go back to, to talk about new regime just one more time with this. I know I'm rambling, but I want to do it. The peaks in these cycles on, on starts, the peaks is two and a half million. Every time we went up, we got to two and a quarter, two and a half million. And the last time we hit that figure was in January of 06, right? That peak on the, on the right there is January of 06. Now, I talked to the Joint Center for Housing Studies in October of 06, and they wanted to know what I, my forecast was for starts, and I said, I don't forecast. They said, well, what do you think it's gonna be? And I said, I'll give you a range. I, I think last, every cycle that it's gone down like it's going down now, and it was in free fall then, starts were just, dropping like a rock, you can see it. I said, it's gone, through, it's gone down below a million. They said, you're crazy. I said, why am I crazy? They said, because the demographics are there. Look at the household formation numbers. The baby boom echo's coming and the immigration's coming and all this is going on. Housing starts are not gonna go below 1.5 million annualized. I said, okay. They, they basically threw me out and said they weren't gonna invite me back. Well, it went down to a million. And it went through a million to 800,000, which it had never been to before. It had not been below 780,000 ever. I'm, I'm talking 60 years of data that we it never went below 800,000 in all of that time period, except for one, actually there's one month in the 91 period where it got to 780, 780,000. That was one month that came right back up and that's in, the, in that pointy one in the, the last pointy trough. We have now been below 700,000 for 38 consecutive months. 780,000. This doesn't look like a big deal. Oh, what did I do, what did I do? This thing here, where's my little pointer? I can't find it. There it is. That's 38 months. And that is, you know, we've had one month below 700,000, below 800,000 in the history of the data. And, and, and the peaks were two and a half million. You take the difference between two and a half million home, homes being built and 500,000 homes being built, that's 75 to 80% of the industry wiped out. It's a 78 production, we cut production 80% and then it sits there for 36 months. That's a big problem. That's a new regime. 
Normally, by the way, it's the housing production cycle that cures the imbalance. You want, you, what brought the market back into equilibrium in the, in the past has not been prices going up and down because people ignore those price signals. When prices go down, people won't sell. So the observed prices stay up. What clears the market has been traditionally production. If you, if you overbuild or you got a down cycle, people put up signs, volume stop. People don't sell and people stop building. And then household formation catches up and you got a new equilibrium. But it's been that production side that cleared the market. Well, it's not coming near clearing it, partially because we overbuilt, partially because prices fell, and it's a new regime. It really is a new regime. And, and whether it's a permanently new regime or it's just a real bad cycle, we have yet to resolve. Now let's talk about the two, those two propositions. Is it an entirely new regime or, is it, or are we a new cycle? Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about the positives. If you look out there today, what do you see? Um, the first thing you see is cheap housing relative to any time in the recent past. It's, it's not all, in all places, not in all nooks and crannies of the market. You have to look at the detail. I look at zip code level, and there are cities where some prices are going up and other prices are down, but there are, in every city in the United States, there are prices that were unheard of years ago, a few years ago. Uh, and I have kids graduating from college. My, my former students are buying things that they could not in their wildest dreams have bought a while back. Uh, and you just have to look around Florida to see it. You know it, you see it every day. So it's cheap, and interest rates are low. The problem, of course, is credit, getting credit. But if you, if you can get credit, it's extraordinary what you can buy today uh, as affordable housing. The biggest issue in Boston has always been affordable housing. Now it's affordable housing in places you'd like to live, really like to live, and there's some stuff there. Uh, so price, that's, that's the way most markets clear. Price goes down, it brings back demanders, it get, calls out some supply, and you get new equilibrium. It's not going to happen overnight like that, but it's, it's certainly that the price decline and the low interest rates, which make up the bulk of the housing cost, is uh, pretty good. And then you think about housing as an investment today. You know, people forget that it's very, very, very tax favored. You buy a house outright, what's the yield? What's the dividend? You start out with the imputed rent. You start out with the value of the housing services that the house generates for you. You live in a bloody thing. You live in it. That's part of the yield. The only country in the world that taxes that is Canada. We don't tax it. We subsidize it. But it's, 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 it's a part of the real yield. If we suggested to the American taxpaying population that that we were going to tax imputed rent, they would go crazy. Imputed rent is the rent they don't pay because they own their home. They don't get it, but they, it, if you've ever worked for imputed rent, which I have, my wife and I ran a Harvard dorm for a couple of years and they paid us by giving us free room and board. If you think that's not income, it is. Because it's a, it's a, it was a substantial amount of our total income and it was not taxed. Imputed rent on owner-occupied housing is the biggest housing subsidy in the Congress outside of what Fannie and, Fre Fannie and Freddie do. And it's about $360 billion a year. So you can, if I told you I had an asset for you to buy, it would pay you about 6%, 5.5%, 6 tax-free, and guaranteed as long as you hold it to generate a real return of 5 or 6%, you'd say that's a pretty good deal, right? Adjusted for inflation, 5% yield. That's what imputed rent is today. Then you say, well, not only do we not tax imputed rent, but we're going to let you deduct the interest you use to borrow to get that free income. So you get a, 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 a and then we'll, we'll, of course, take your property tax and let you deduct it too, because that's a ticket to local public goods. And we believe that people need to be good citizens and vote for good schools and be well behaved. So there's another $250 billion. <coughs> It's a pretty good deal living in a, in a house where you pay the property tax and get it deductible and interest deductible. And, it, and, then, and then you've got the home buyer tax credit, lest we forget. That worked, worked quite well. Got demand to come back an inch. And then it went away and it, the, the, the boost went away with it. So the, the big issue is it's affordable. 
but more than it was. It's getting cheaper by the, in some places by the day. If you get credit, it's, 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 it's uh, about as low as interest rates can possibly go if they don't go below zero. Um, some more good news. Starts. Starts. I, I, I gave a talk about a week ago and I said, Starts number's coming out in a week. If it goes above 700,000, open a bottle of wine. Uh, if it goes above 800,000, open a bottle of champagne. If it goes below 600,000, get drunk. And so the number came out, 699. 699, it's not back to seven. Seven would have put us back to the level that we were at in, uh, if it went over seven, it would have taken us back to the level we were at 38 months ago. But it just missed it, 699, so I don't know what they did. But it was 699 yesterday, that's a pretty good number, it's up substantially. And you look at all the key indicators in the, I look at about five things every, every month. I look at existing sales, new sales, existing inventories, new inventories, starts, and these things, pending home sales, which is kind of a BS number. But, but if you look at all those, they're all up a little bit. The inventory of for sale property, which is a little squirrely, and I'll tell you in a minute why, the inventory of for sale property is terrific. Six months supply in the existing sales market are for sale, six months supply in the new sales. I hear the condo market down here is tight, I hear the condo market in Boston is tight. The market is tighter than it was given the existing property for sale. But the existing property for sale has behind it the shadow inventory, the shadow knows. I don't know what the shadow inventory is. You get 10 different definitions when you talk to 10 different people. But it ranges from 2 million to 40 million or something. It's a big number. The best number comes from a woman named Lori Goodman who works for Amherst Securities. If you can get her report, it's really insightful. But the shadow inventory is behaving in ways, the shadow inventory is stuff that's for sale, but you can't find a sign on it. And you can't find it in the multiple listings. There's people who are ready to sell as soon as the market turns. It's like, like a sump pump. The water comes up and when it gets to a certain level, it flushes it all out. And it comes back, gets up that level. It's the, the, the shadow inventory comes to play when house prices start to move to keep them in check. And it will, all these things happening, slow down in production, staying flat, that's, that's, that's still flat. It's up to 699, but it's still flat. You're talking about 1.5 million, 1.75 million, 2 million. It's flat. The housing market is bouncing along a rocky bottom, showing strength in a lot of areas, and clearing in about eight different ways. It's clearing because people are buying stuff at auction. It's clearing because there are bottom fishermen out there buying and flipping. It's clearing because people are buying bargains. It's clearing because some of it's being torn down. Right, here's, the, here's the way to think about it. This is the way you think. You've got to think about the market in the long run. You've got a bunch of houses. The left-hand side is the supply side. The right-hand side is the demand side. And these things are doing crazy things right now. Just walk through them real quickly. On the left-hand side, housing stock, we talked about housing starts. Housing starts are still in the vicinity of half a million. That's a small, 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 small number. We've created 1.5 million households per year for a long time. It dropped in the, in the last decade a little bit. It's down to 1 1.2, 1 1.1, 1 0.9. It's drifting down. And all of a sudden, in the last couple of years, household formations have gone flat. But how, housing production, we know, is flat. Let's look at the, the, the one I just started talking about was removals. Go to Cleveland. Go to Detroit, go to some places in Florida, and they're, they're bulldozing it. It gets to the tax guys, the property tax guys, the property tax guys take it and clear it. So there, are, we don't, there's no way to count that. It's a residual in the census number. At least I can't find it. Uh, but you'd like to know how many we were taken out every month. But we don't get that number. So you have to look at that as a judge. I think they're up a lot. So, Part of the clearing process on the left-hand side is we're not building and, we're, not, and we're, we're removing at some pace the stuff where the copper was taken out the third day of, ban of bankruptcy. And the truck backs up and takes stuff out of the house. Now the right-hand side is where the action is, I think, right now. 
The right-hand side is the new households coming online. And they've baffled us before. There's a guy called Greg Mankiw, a good friend of, of Wayne and David. He, he, he has a textbook that outsells mine. It's, it's not as good either. That's, that's a lie. It's a, it's a good book. I just don't think he writes very well. But it's a, he sells a million copies a year. So, um, no, that's not true. He sells 300,000. The market is a million. That's still a lot of money. But Greg wrote a paper called The Baby Boom, The Baby Bust in the Housing Market back in 1989, and he said the housing market would collapse in the 1990s. And in that paper, he, he uh, got a couple of things wrong. One was he forgot the supply side, and the supply side explains a lot of the variation across states. The other thing he forgot was immigration. He, it wasn't he forgot it, we didn't know, but there were t we, had two, we had 20 million people we didn't know we had when we did the 2000, we did the 1990 census. And we had 2,000 households that actually filled a big hole with the baby boomers aging and no longer forming households. That addition of a big block in the middle created household formation rates that were flat and up a little bit rather than sharply down. And so we had pretty high expectations on, on immigration, household formation rates uh, did have, have fallen though. If you look at the data, well, let me just say, say the other components of it. You've got households, immigration, and emigration. People coming here and going. I, I, I don't think it would surprise you to know that fewer people are coming here from abroad. We're not real welcoming these days, if you've listened to talk radio, uh, immigrants, despite the fact we're a nation built on immigr immigrants. Um, and, and more people are going back. I have kids graduate who five, ten years ago would have stayed and got a job. And uh, I've got to talk a little faster. I'm almost done. Um, age distribution of the population, the baby boomers are aging, but they're not going out of business. The first edge of the baby boomers is me. Um, I was born in 1946. My dad came home from the war. That was the beginning of the, of the ha everything has been done in the economy for me over the last 30, 40 years. Um, they've catered to my age group, uh, and, and so and it goes back to the birth year, 64, 46 to 64, roughly. It's a long period of time. The leading edge of the baby boomers are indeed downsizing. They're selling property, um, but they're also buying. The, the, particularly the ones that are a little younger. How do they buy? Well, they're, they're buying with cash. Where do they get it? Well, there was a big boom before the bust. And a lot of people bought during that boom, including myself. I bought a house for $56,000 in Wellesley when I went to teach there in 1976. 56000 I made more money living in that house over the next 10 years than I made teaching by a lot. Just living in the house. Why? Went up to $280,000 from 56000 That's a lot of money. This was, this, was, this was true of every property in Boston. In fact, the inflation house prices deposited $150 billion on the bank, on the balance sheet of the household sector in Boston alone. That had a big effect on me. It's why I started studying housing. I couldn't understand where it came from. How come I have a quarter of a million dollars all of a sudden? I had a quarter of a million bucks. I was a teacher. My salary when I went to Wells, it was $17,000 a year. And I've got an asset of a quarter of a million. That meant I could trade up. So I went out and bid up with my big asset the price of the next level. That happened all over the country, in the, particularly on the coast. Not all over the country, but it certainly happened in California and the Northeast. Slightly different timing. California is 25% of the value in the country. California and Florida, just the two of them, is 33% of the value in the country. 33%, 7.5% is Florida, if you just add up the, the value of the stock. 7.5% is Florida and 25% is California, it's almost a third. If you take California and combine it with the Northeast that had the big cycle, it's half the country. Northeast, New England and New York, and New Jersey, and California had big cycle and it was half the value in the country. If you bought in any time before the beginning of the downturn, um, so you just take it back to 75 to be safe that I say this. You're, you're almost a millionaire in the value of your house. You've certainly got a lot of equity and you're still using it 
And if you're, if, you're, if you're one of those people like me, I'm indifferent whether prices go up or down because the price of the house I own is gonna move in the same direction as the price of the house I might wanna buy. If prices are going up, my house goes up, so does the one I wanna buy. So by and large, even though there are differences and people in different circumstances and different neighborhoods and people pull more money out, less money out, I'm not arguing everybody's just the same, but don't think the baby boomers don't have equity because they do and they're using it and buying. We're doing 4.7 million sales a year. 4 million, 4.7 million. The, the number for the last existing home sales figure was 4.6 million. 4,600,000. That's a lot of home sales. And that's mostly in the regular market. There's a million, a million of those are auctions, something like that. But all this is happening at the same time. Most of the indicators are up. What's the negative side? Here's the, here's the things that are, are weighing on the minds of people. Well, there are a lot of places that still have not burned off the huge inventory of property in foreclosure. You know that, it's still here in Florida. It's burning off faster in Florida. The number came out from Ready to Data Quick yesterday. The auction rate is up. They're moving the property through a little faster. They're, every day there's a different program that's got 26 billion in equity relief for Florida to another 10 billion for California, I don't know what it is. I'm just overwhelmed by the numbers. They're throwing it at, they're gonna to try to get that through, but it's still there, it's not done. And that's, you look at Florida, Arizona, Nevada, those are the three that got hit by the overbuilding, they got hit by the, 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 the credit the worst. Uh, they're not clear yet. Um, the Northeast is doing reasonably well. We're down 13% since peak. Um, other places are down 50% since peak. Parts of California, parts down here, location. You have to look at the micro level. There are markets that are clearing now. And there are markets that won't clear for a number of years. And you, can, you, you guys know better than I do which ones those are. There are, there are places where people want to go, where they continue to want to go. I-95 and I-93, last time I checked, were still open. And so people are still coming down here and they're going somewhere. They're not going to the places that got decimated. They're going to places where there's good stuff and they're bidding the prices back up. That's occurring nationwide. It's happening in Boston where the western, western suburbs are up. The rest of the places are, are down and they're really down in the places that got decimated. So uh, and one other negative, I hate to end on a negative sign. We got a lot of credit in the hands, a lot of paper in the hands of Fannie and Freddie and a lot of paper in the hands of the FHA or guaranteed by the FHA. FHA is still extending mortgage, mortgage insurance. Um, and some of the terms look like the terms that we were doing in the, in the deep part of the mess. And I don't think it was just, it was, it was the terms of loans, it was the fact that the collateral collapsed that created those losses. So I'm not worried about that occurring again from this point. But if you, if you look at what they've got, they've got a lot of paper they paid for that they're holding on their books. That means they're absorbing risk. If you look at the risk in the mortgage, holding mortgage paper today, a lot of it is owned by the federal government. There's a trillion of it on the books of the Fed itself, a trillion and a quarter on the balance sheet of the Fed. There's a, there's a bunch of it in the hands of Fannie and Freddie, and the FHA's insured a bunch of it. The mood of Congress is not gonna be to extend that guarantee. It's gonna be to reduce it. It's gonna pull back the risk. Their, their goal, and you can talk to both sides of the aisle on this one, they want to get the risk back onto the, the borrower. They don't want to just have a credit yet, yes or no, they want to have risk-based pricing. That's where we're going, let there be no doubt about it. We're going to risk-based pricing. If you have a low credit score, you're going to pay a higher interest rate. That's coming down the pike. It could be as much as 300 basis points. So as long as the feds have all that paper on its books, it's not counting that risk. It's not showing up in the, in, the, in the price of other paper. But when that stuff gets put back in the market, mortgage prices are gonna go down and interest rates are gonna go up and that's gonna be a big problem. It's gonna be hard for them to figure out how to privatize or do what they wanna do with Fannie and Freddie. And that's why it's not being discussed in the presidential primaries because it's too painful a, a problem. I gotta shut up because I gotta go catch a plane, but I can take a few, I, I, as long as I get out of here in five minutes, I can take a few questions. Thank you very much. Hearing none, or do I hear any? Any questions? Yeah, there's a question. When will Florida's housing market reach equilibrium? 
Oh, well, I think I answered that. And I said, sometime between now and the next five years, you'll see markets doing it every year. Some, some markets are in equilibrium now. Some markets won't be in equilibrium for another five years. And you guys are better equipped to make that diagnosis than I am. But it's, it's not something that happens, bang, it's at equilibrium, bang, it's at disequilibrium. It's you, you get supply getting closer to demand at the margin every quarter. And for some places, it's going to be a while because nobody wants to buy them. And those markets are illiquid. Uh, but the markets that are liquid are experiencing recovery. That if you look at the five things that affect supply and demand, they're all functioning to get the supply and demand closer together. But we're not there yet, certainly in aggregate. And how you call, them, call a market to be back in equilibrium, I don't know. But I can say Boston is closer than Florida. Yes, sir. I think, I think we are. I don't think it's going to be dramatic, but there's no doubt that anybody who lived through the last five years and has saw the foreclosures that occurred and the pain it brought to people, there's no doubt that people knew there was risk. We, Bob, Bob Schiller and I sur sur survey people every year. We survey 2,000 home buyers every year in every market. And in, in, in the first 10 years we did that survey, nobody thought there was any risk in the housing market. Housing prices will go up, if not now, next time in the future, they will go up. 80, 90% of the people said there's no risk in the housing market. Now they say, 50% of the people say, there's risk in the housing market. And I think you can't have lived through that period of time and not have a little bit different, a different attitude. And is it is a completely different point of view? Has it gone from the house, owning a house being the American dream to the house being an American nightmare? I don't think it's done that. And if you look at the pricing, as I was going through those, those numbers about what you can afford today, it's still nice to own your own home. Sometimes, when the roof blows off and the heater goes bad, and you have to, you discovered you bought a bad business. I mean, it's not a great, not an easy business to run. And I think it's, but I, I think that people are going to look at it more health, with, with a little bit healthier attitude now. That's going to probably mean that the home ownership rate will come down. Also, there's more mobility. People are changing jobs a lot. People are getting laid off a lot. When that occurs, the you don't you don't you used to buy a house, live in it your whole life. That's what I did. I took one job and I stayed at it for 34 years. I'm, I'm, I'm an albatross. Is that the right word? No, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm behind the times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I give you an answer to that, but I'd be pulling it from right behind me here. Um, it, it just, I mean, if you, think about, if you think about lifestyle, I mean, I can think of a reason to prefer in a freestanding single family house as a renter. You got the, all the advantage of having a landlord, but you don't have neighbors on the other side of the wall. And some people like that, some people don't. And I think, I think people are, I think divorce rates up, people are moving around. This, this, uh, this record I played indicates the divorce rate's going to go down now because the housing market's been tight. I don't know. I, I, your guess is as good as mine. I think people, I rented a one family house once and I liked it. It was, it was a cool deal and, and it was precisely the reason that I did it was I didn't want people on the other side of the walls from me and uh, it was, uh, I had a landlord to call who took care of the crap I didn't want to take care of. Last one.
I think the children of the boomers are behaving largely the way their parents did. I don't think there's a big, there's a difference between the baby boomers and their parents who lived through the depression. And it may be the people who lived through this thing and got burned by, had friends who got burned by it and these, they behaved differently. That may, that may be what you're looking for in structural change. I think another explanation for this is, it was just a big bang. It was a big bang and we'll get over it. I don't know. I mean, it's taken a long time to get over it, and it was a huge bang. You wipe out trillions of dollars of wealth that people thought they had. You know, you, and you're wiping out of people who put cash in, not people who just lived in their house. You get different experiences, and whether that's a structural change or not, I don't know. It's a, it's a big bad, and so big bads you could call structural changes, the structure of their, bra structure of their brains. Thank you very, very much.